Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Uh, can I ask everyone to, in the room to ensure mobiles are on silent? Um, there are apologies this morning from David Torrance and Bob Doris is substituting for David. Welcome, Bob. The first item on our agenda is an evidence session with NHS Dumfries and Galloway as part of our programme of one-off evidence sessions with each of the territorial boards. Uh, and the focus of these sessions is on performance against local delivery plans. Uh, can I welcome to the committee uh, Philip Jones, the chairman, uh, Jeff Ace, chief executive, uh, Julie White, uh, chief operating officer and chief officer of the Integrated Joint, Integration Joint Board, and Dr. Kenneth Donaldson, medical director. Welcome. Uh, can I start by asking about issues of financial sustainability. There's a statement in Parliament this afternoon on last week's report by Audit Scotland. I'm sure uh, all health boards will have been reading that avidly over the last few days. Um, uh, but clearly, each board has its own challenges to face and its own issues to address. Uh, can I ask you to start, to start us off uh, what progress the board is making to ensure that savings are achieved on a recurring uh, and sustainable basis? So, firstly, thank, thanks for the invite. Uh, sure. Very pleased to sort of answer all of your questions, and we'll take it either in turn or collectively. Uh, so, uh, Jeff. Yes, thanks, Phil. I, I thought the Audit Scotland report was very fair in its assessment of the challenges, and from a Dumfries and Galloway perspective, we've been a board that has always broken even. Um, it's been tough over the last five or six years, in particular, but we have always achieved our um, revenue and capital targets. This year is far and away the toughest it has ever been. Um, we still believe that we will achieve a break-even position at year end, but uh, as you'll have seen from some of our submissions, we're using a, a quite a significant amount of non-recurrent um, windfall savings to achieve that, that break-even position. And the challenge for us, exactly as set out in the Audit Scotland report, is to try and create that three to five year vision of what a sustainable health and social care system looks like with the resources that we have to play with. I think for, again, in, from a parochial point of view in Dumfries and Galloway, the biggest single cost improvement we can make is to address our recruitment challenges. We're paying quite a considerable premium at the moment for uh, locum staff, locum medical staff in particular, but also some nurse agency costs have been creeping up. If we can address those recruitment challenges, and, and hopefully we can hear from uh, Ken and others of some of the work that we're doing to do that today, then that, that makes a significant financial contribution to us, certainly in the region of five to seven million pounds of, of potential savings there. So I think we, we are... We are in a difficult position, as, as you will have heard from colleagues across Scotland. We believe we will break even this year, but the, the, the prize is for us to set out to you a sustainable model, and at the moment we don't have that over the next three to five years. Thank you very much. One of the things that's striking about the Audit Scotland report is, across the country, how far uh, boards have been uncertain of where they were going to find savings for, for a given financial year and the way in which that's increased um, from, from the beginning of the financial year two years ago to uh, the beginning of last financial year to the beginning of this financial year. Uh, is that the case for yourselves? And, and when you talk about finding six or seven million pounds of savings, does that include a significant number of savings that you have not yet been able to identify? We, we do have unidentified savings at the moment that we're going to need to pull back by year end just to break even. So we're looking in the region and, and the figure changes on a week-by-week a -week basis, as you can imagine, in an organisation of 350, 360 million. But at the moment, we're looking at uh, an unidentified savings gap for this year of around about three million pounds. Now, that's within the, the range that we think is achievable for us to pull back. But what is much more concerning to me is if I look at our underlying financial position and strip out all those non-recurrent savings, then I'm probably looking at closer to a gap of nine to 11 million pounds as my, as my challenge for next year. That's a big target after five or six years of, of um, difficult cost savings. I, it might be useful to hear from, from Julie White as board chief operating officer and, and the chief officer of the IGB just some of the, the, the ongoing plans and uh, potential plans for next year at this point. Thank you very much. Julie. Okay, th 
Thank you very much. Um, in terms of our long-term plans, we have in the Health and Social Care Partnership introduced something called our Business Transformation Programme. And that is a programme that's a three to five year programme for reducing um, expenditure on health and social care services and, and producing the required level of savings. And it really is about addressing the challenges highlighted in the Audit Scotland report around transforming the way in which we deliver health and social care services. So there's a number of specific projects contained within our business transformation programme that are looking at the redesign of health and social care services within our localities, um, that are also looking at the future shape of how we deliver um, social care services with much more of a, um, a focus on prevention. And um, we are looking at a range of, within the Health and Social Care Partnership, obviously a range of specific savings in relation to our social work um, budgets. We also have... Um, given each of our services, each of our directorates, an efficiency target, so a 2% efficiency target that we expect each of our service areas to deliver um, within the next year. And plans are being developed in partnership with our clinical and professional teams to deliver those targets. But as Jeff said, um, we have got significant challenges in terms of our recruitment. And those recruitment challenges are not just within health within Dumfries and Galloway. Those recruitment challenges exist right across health and social care. Um, so we find that our provider partners within the local authority in terms of our care at home providers and our care home providers are also struggling to recruit staff. So that remains a significant challenge right across the whole health and social care partnership. From my <coughs> perspective as, as board chief exec, if, if we're faced with a, a sort of one to one and a half percent cost reduction target, I can be fairly relaxed with that. Um, our, our systems tend to innovate at about that rate and will generate their own cost efficiencies of around about that 1%, one and a half. The difficulty over the last two or three years is that that target's been two and a half plus. And that's the point at which we've certainly locally had to rely on some non-recurrent uh, advantages. We're doing a lot of property rationalisation, for example, at the moment, uh, and, and been able to take advantage of our move to the new hospital to divest ourselves of some very expensive uh, older, older facilities. But, but those sort of things can only be done once. Uh, and that, that's our concern at the moment, is that, is that viability, if the future is around 2%, is 2.5% around cost reduction, that is historically more than, than health systems have generated in savings. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandra White. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, everyone. Uh, having read through the report, one of the areas that I'm quite interested in is the rising drugs costs, and you mentioned that in your, your paper as well. Uh, basically, there's still a challenge, and I know that you have some efficiency savings there <coughs> from 9% expenditure uh, compared to 13% expenditure in the 2016-2017 report. I mean, what steps are the board taking to help reduce that? Bring Ken Donaldson in um, to answer specifically on some areas of, of realistic medicine that we're, we're addressing. But to make a general point on, on drugs, I think over the last five or six years, I think the, the increase in acute drug costs in particular has been a real problem for us. And Scottish Government have been aware of this and have been very helpful in terms of establishing the new drugs fund, uh, which has really um, enabled us to deal with, with some of this up to now. But I think if that, if that pace of increase in acute drugs, particularly um, very high cost end of life drugs, for example, continues and we don't see industry ad, ad, um, ad, adapting its pricing model for the, the sort of financial pressures we are, it, it is again quite difficult to see how we can generate, generate continually enough money to be able to, to meet those, that drug inflation. So that's, that's been a real, probably a change over the last five or six years, whereas Previously, we'd been worried about GP prescribing and the growth there. It's been acute prescribing over the last four, four, five, six years that has really um, been, been beyond our predictions. But I'll, I'll bring uh, Ken Donaldson in. Yes, so um, realistic medicine, as you know, is a, a, a national um, agenda. And that's one aspect for looking at how we can reduce some of that, that drug spending, especially the, the really high cost drugs in that these drugs are available and often they are they are some of them can, are fantastic and can be you know really life enhancing but as jeff mentions often they can be used at end of life and maybe aren't actually adding quality and i think a key part of this is a, a kind of cultural change in, in in the medical community as well as in the general public around 
know, what what is the quality we're getting from this medication? Is it actually going to is it going to extend your life? Is it going to give you um, you know enough time that is of value? And I think the, the part of the realistic medicine agenda that are in shared decision making is something that really is, is striving to address this, and that we're having real meaningful conversations with patients and their families. Um, not just around drugs, obviously, around all, all um, forms of, of, of treatment that are available. Um, so in Dumfries and Galloway, um, we have been um, working on real estate medicine for, for several years now. We have a, a team um, that are dedicated really to that, led by one of our um, associate medical directors. Um, and there are a number of um, areas of improvement looking at that shared decision making and quality feedback from patients about how they feel consultations have gone and um, leading to smaller um, part, bits of work to try to change I think behaviours in, in I say, the medical community and what the public expectations are around that um, and there are a number of areas of work also at, kind of, at the lower end of, of medications that aren't quite so expensive but aren't maybe so necessary so ensuring that if we are using medications we're using the, the ones that are most cost effective um, and are, are, again, are adding the, the best value. So that, that again is a bit around um, public engagement and public uh, um, education around what what it is they should be asking for and what we should be delivering. Uh, thank you. It's obviously not just the Fries and Galloway. It's a, a national uh, situation. And you mentioned expectations. <coughs> Excuse me. Is that one of the the biggest problems? The expectations, or could it be that if we're looking at it nationally, and obviously these. Um, Particular, some particular drugs, uh, the newspapers will create a story out of it, etc., and, and lead on to people's expectations. But you had mentioned, uh, Mr. Ace, in regards to the rising costs, should we be doing something about perhaps the profit that drug companies are making? Maybe you don't want to answer that question, but you did say over the last five years that it has risen. Uh, so, therefore, it seems a kind of unfair advantage that the drug companies have mixed with the media and the expectations of the general public as they're being told. I mean, how do we tackle that? It's a profoundly difficult question, not, and clearly not just a Scottish question. This is affecting the whole of um, Western medicine, uh, essentially, in, in what, the drug, what products the drug companies choose to produce at what price. Um, is, is very challenging to us. I think SMC, the Scottish Medicines Consortium that was established around about 2000, 2001, um, was pretty groundbreaking in its time and, and did create a challenge back to industry about the, the value that we would put onto new products and we used quite sophisticated health economic evaluations looking at qualities, the quality adjusted life years and the price that we would pay uh, for a new product. I think that did um, create a different relationship with industry. Uh, I understand that, that we, we've uh, relatively recently, we've made exceptions to that process for um, end-of-life drugs for some uh, cancer products, and I fully understand why that, that, that is ethically, morally seen as the right way to go. But we must make sure we don't lose that challenge back to industry that, that um, enables us to procure at, the, at, a, at a price that, that doesn't um, cause huge pressure elsewhere in the system. It is, it is clearly very easy for us as health systems to spend money it is enormously difficult at the moment to, to fund that increase by taking money elsewhere. Yep. <coughs> Could I, sorry, Please. Chair. Uh, thank, thank you very much for, for that. Do we have evidence from any other countries where the drugs which obviously are being put forward just now are cheaper to buy? There are. Uh, it's been some while since I've sat on Scottish Medicines Consortium, so I might be slightly out of date. There are different approaches across the world. Um, New Zealand used to be cited as a country that had negligible relationship with industry and bought at spot price, um, so essentially constantly seeking the lowest market price. The difficulty with that is, is New Zealand has no pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so it, has, it does not benefit in the same way from research projects, from um, rapid access to drug trials that, that patients in Scotland do. So I think there needs to be a partnership with industry. Uh, I think that that is valuable to the citizens of Scotland, but it mustn't come at, at, at the price of us not being able to challenge back on product price and challenge back effectively. Sorry, just one tiny wee last question. Uh, do you think Brexit will make it worse? to get these drugs at a reasonable price or perhaps 
even a higher price or not get them at all? It, it, it is possible. There are, there are, from, from a health service point of view, there are two, two distinct Brexit issues. There is the short-term uh, disruption of a, of a no deal in which we're, case we're very concerned about the availability of a number of um, products. Longer term, uh, potentially because we are we are moving out of the European Medicines Agency, there may be um, some uh, requirements to purchase from global markets that will almost inevitably be more expensive. And we can see examples of products that are a factor of three or four times more expensive than we are currently procuring. So Brexit, um, it, it, it is without wishing to be flippant, it's, it's hard to find an area that Brexit doesn't uh, give us great cause for concern at the moment, and drugs is certainly one of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, two brief supplementaries, uh, Bob Doris and then Dave Stewart. Yeah, just very briefly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that, that, that pricing of medicines is a reserve issue and done on a pan-UK basis, but reimbursement is devolved and the SMC and there's special measures being developed, ongoing and active. This committee will be looking at it in relation to orphan and ultra-orphan uh, medicines for you know rare, rare conditions and, and the like. Uh, there's a lot of emerging good work and partnership in relation to outcomes-based reimbursement for orphan and ultra-orphan medicines. So uh, drug companies, shock horror, make huge claims about the benefits of certain medicines and procedures, but you don't actually know in real time how that's going to deliver until you actually administer that medication. Scotland's great at retaining data and following patients through the CHI number right through. Real opportunities there to actually make drugs affordable because if they do what drug companies say they will do, you get delivery and you can save money. Is Dumfries and Galloway Health Board actively involved in discussions with the SMC and the Scottish Government to look at uh, outcomes-based reimbursement, not just for orphan and ultra-orphan conditions, but more widely. Represented around the SMC table and the New Drugs Committee table, so we are, we are in the midst of that. I think it's, it's as you say, it's, it's a fascinating area. Um, we've, I guess there has been some concern for a considerable number of years about um, the, the um, fullness of clinical trial data that is presented. Um, publicly and which trials are published and which trials aren't published. Clearly what you're suggesting um, based on outcomes gets around that completely and gives us genuine real patient data and that will be invaluable. Uh, thank you. Back to uh, Brexit, I've taken a big interest uh, over the last six months um, on the withdrawal from Euratom which I know was notified in Article 50 letter by the Prime Minister. The great concern I've got is that we import our radioisotopes from Europe, which provides about 60 to 80 percent of the world's source. You well know, uh, as medical experts, the great worries about the half-life, so basically it can't be stored very easily. Is this something the board has looked at specifically? The board um, will be taking a paper to public board in either either January or to either December or in its January performance committee on the uh, risks of Brexit to um, NHS and Fries and Galloway. We are sharing that paper with other boards, with other mainland boards, to try and uh, make sure that we have a coordinated uh, risk assessment, that we've all got basically the same understanding of where the risks are. For us, there, uh, as with all territorial boards, there is a real concern over a no-deal scenario uh, and our instruction to plan for potentially 6 to 12 weeks of disruption to um, our supply chains. That affects the Euratom products, that also affects our basic um, clinical products and indeed um, how we um, feed and maintain patients in hospitals. So we, we, are, we are profoundly concerned about the prospect of a no deal. I, I, would, I, I hesitate to comment on any prospective deal until I could see the, date, the information on it. Thank you. <coughs> Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. I need to declare first an interest as a former employee of NHS and Fries and Galloway, and I know everybody across the table um, this morning, so thanks for coming today. I'm interested in hearing about the new DGRI, the, the planning, the process, the, the settling in. It's been almost a year now. Um, there are obviously challenges with um, running concurrent uh, sites at Mountain Hall as well as the new build. 
But uh, it's a really good news story that I think we should be sharing, that we've got a brand new hospital in, in Dumfries for Dumfries and Galloway. But obviously there were challenges, financial challenges, and uh, pressures associated with the move to the new hospital. So I'd like to hear a wee bit about that. Just to, to start, the, the new hospital obviously was eight to ten years in the planning, the development and the delivery, and the planning partnership with Highwood Health was a really successful model for, for us in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, and the way in which we engaged particularly uh, with our staffing groups uh, as we came to the later stages of the hospital having been complete, uh, being prepared and made ready for us to, to take occupancy. Uh, we had the HR team uh, that had, did a hugely significant significant piece of work in familiarisation trips uh, with meetings and discussions with, with small groups uh, so people could understand where they were moving from and what they were moving to uh, because obviously you leave one hospital one day and over the weekend you then start the operation in a, in a new one um, and there was a hugely successful uh, management of change process put in uh, so much so that our HR team um, actually won a national award from the healthcare professional body uh, for HR team of the year for the work that they done on that uh, particular work because the most important thing we recognised was patient safety and patient safety had to be guaranteed through uh, the understanding of the staff who moved as to where they were going, what they were doing because it was a wholly different sort of configuration in the new hospital from the old one. So when people used to walk out of theatre and turn left, they wasn't left anymore. So simple things uh, were made more practical and uh, sort of start ready uh, by the background work. Uh, but I'll let Jeff speak and Julie on some of the detailed uh, aspects of the new hospital. If, if I make me around, then I'll hand over to Julie, who was a uh, project lead throughout the, the new build process and uh, delivered um, Scotland's, la at, at the time, NHS Scotland's largest capital project to the day on time and uh, to the pound on budget. We were, we were immensely proud of, of what we achieved. Um, it was far and away the biggest change project we've, we've ever undertaken. We've, we've experienced of building new facilities previously in Stranra and our new uh, mental health unit at, at Dumfries, but nothing on this scale of a complete uh, move and to actually to physically move uh, over 170 patients over the, the uh, weekend in December was the most terrified I've ever been in work and the most proud afterwards of everyone who'd achieved it. It was a, 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 an absolute iconic moment for us. But I'll hand over to Julie, who is the, the single individual most responsible for its success. Thanks very much. No problem, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, I think in terms of the, the move to the new hospital, as Jeff said, it was the single largest change that any of us had been involved in in terms of the senior management team within NHS Dumfries and Galloway and indeed across the Health and Social Care Partnership. And we had been planning for the, the move for some eight years, as Jeff said, um, submitting a business case to Scottish Government in April 2013 um, and then successfully moving into the new hospital in December 2017. And I think the time frame from submission of an outline business case to actually moving into the new hospital is one that's probably not been matched anywhere else in the country. But that work was undertaken, I, I appreciate Jeff's kind comments, but that work was undertaken very much um, as a team. We had an incredibly um, strong team working on the development of the new hospital and much of the success was absolutely down to our clinicians and our clinical teams, our service teams and their engagement with us in developing the plans for the new hospital. Within the new hospital itself, Emma's asking about some of the changes that have taken place. There have been a whole host of changes um, in relation to um, the way in which we deliver services within the acute hospital. So we've developed something called a combined critical care unit, which brings together what you've traditionally got in intensive care units, surgical high dependency and medical high dependency. And that involved real changes for staff in terms of the way in which they worked and how they worked together as a team. And that team really came together and did a lot of preparation work before they moved to the new hospital 
One of the single biggest changes we have in the new hospital is something called our new emergency care centre. And the emergency care centre houses our A&E department, our GP out of hour service and our combined assessment unit. And our combined assessment unit is the unit where our, our patients um, access, um, emergency admissions access that for rapid assessment and diagnosis of their condition with the expectation that we'll turn around those as many of those patients as possible back into the community. Um, and we found that on the in the first sort of six to nine months of operation within the new hospital, our combined assessment unit has turned around 41% of our GP admissions straight back home and um, within about a 12 hour period with the remaining um, individuals going on into our downstream wards. But again, that, that level of change with a combined assessment unit and emergency care centre required a huge amount of planning and a huge amount of investment of time of our clinical teams and working about how and looking at how we were going to work differently to better meet the needs of our population. This was about us having an assessment unit, not an admissions unit. So it's about people coming to the hospital for a rapid assessment and diagnosis and wherever possible, us then supporting them to go back home. We also, within the new hospital, we, we say we are the most digitally enabled hospital in Scotland. It was one of the key factors in developing our new hospital. So our new hospital has Wi-Fi throughout the new hospital. The Wi-Fi also supports the telephone system and it supports our telemetry system, which supports our, our sickest patients within the hospital. We've also introduced electronic patient records, an electronic prescribing system and an electronic ordering system for diagnostic tests. We have also introduced a range of um, technology, um, a roaming desktop in our wards, which means that our clinicians within the single patient bedrooms can access the patient information within the patient bedroom, within the roaming desktops. So we're very, very proud of the technology that we have within the new hospital. The, one of the key features of the new hospital, which I'm sure the committee will be aware of, is that we moved to a hospital that was 100% single rooms. And that, in the very early days of our planning, required myself and members of the team to have quite significant engagement with our communities around the fact we were moving to 100% single rooms because there was some concern and some anxiety about the fact that patients were, um, some of our population were concerned about loneliness and isolation within the single rooms. But I'm delighted to say that when we had our patient experience week earlier on in the year and we got some feedback from our patients in terms of the use of the single rooms, we had feedback that they really loved the environment, that they felt that it made seeing their family easier. We have an open visiting policy within the new hospital, so family members, friends can attend the hospital at any time, day or night. Um, they felt the hospital wards were calmer as a result of the single rooms and they loved the fact that they had a TV in each of the patient bedrooms. Um, but in, in terms of, in, the, we also did get some feedback though that it wasn't ideal for some of our older patients um, who maybe didn't have family members or friends close by. Um, so we've done a number of things within each of the wards. We've got a socialisation space where when patients are ready, they can access that. And we've also um, used volunteers within the hospital. We're really delighted with the number of volunteers we have in um, Dumfries and Galloway. We've got over 200 volunteers and we've got ward-based volunteers who support people who are maybe isolated and don't have visitors. So, as I say, that there's been lots of developments within the new hospital, lots of advantages, but we do have an ongoing challenge around recruitment. Um, Jeff mentioned it earlier, it is one of our really significant challenges. We'll, we'll, move, on. Okay. we'll move on to address recruitment in okay. a moment. I wonder if you can perhaps simply say something around the financial pressures and the consequences of operating so, all the new hospitals side by side. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we'd always intended to leave some ambulatory services at our old sites. So we've left uh, renal dialysis, some therapies and ophthalmology at, at that old site to make the Mountain Hall Treatment Centre. They, those services do not do not need to be on an acute hospital site. So we wanted to create a more um, a, a, um, a, a setting more suitable for ambulatory care for people to to walk up and be treated in that that's that's moved well we budgeted for the double running costs of that um what we hadn't i think sufficiently appreciated was the scale of uh, additional staffing required in our in our new hospital we'd budgeted for an increase of around 80 staff and we recruited to almost all of those posts before moving but we've since um, recognized that that staffing is itself not optimum and we've moved to it to recruit further staff on uh, in addition to that this year so that's 
um, it's within the, the um, three million pounds of unidentified savings that I've quoted earlier, so it's not putting any additional pressures. And I said, as I said, we would still anticipate a break-even position this year, but it, it has been noticeable the sheer footprint of the hospital, the new ways of working around the front door, and the single rooms issues are probably testing some of the traditional staffing models that we used to, to set our, our um, baseline staffing. And I think that's an issue that our, um, our nurse director, Eddie Doherty, has raised uh, nationally, that we do need to look at tools for single room nursing to make sure that the advice for, for future developments is bang up to date. You've covered already how we, I guess, the, the challenges of dual sites or double sites. Um, how, how do the staff then engage if you're needing dialysis in intensive care, for instance, but you're running regular dialysis at uh, Mountain Hall? Um, we've got dialysis centres uh, across the region, Srinwar, Kirkubri as well. So do those staff manage to float? Do they agree to do that is that part of the challenges is looking at models of working that the that the staff are actually accepting uh, convener, I'll, I'll defer to our nephrologist in, uh, alongside me yes so <coughs> as a renal physician I guess I should answer that one um there was there was a, a lot of planning I guess around the the move towards having the split site working um, I guess one way of looking at this, you, you've mentioned we've got satellite units, Stranar, Kukubri, and in some ways the Mountain Hall Centre is a satellite as well, although it does act as a kind of main base. Um, we recognise there would be staffing issues around this because we need to have rotas for nursing staff to be in the acute hospital to deal with your ICU patients and patients on the, on the renal ward, and we need medical staff as well. So there were increases in both numbers, and, and particularly being, we recruited ultimately an extra renal consultant of the staff numbers to make that, that rota workable. Um, like a lot of aspects of moving into new hospital, there's been some teething around just how that works, but I'm pleased to say I think the team are in a good place now. They've got to the point where they, you know, it's a very different way of working than they used to. And, and you know, when you mentioned about how the patients requiring dialysis, if they're in the Mountain Hall Centre, in, when that was the main hospital, getting an x-ray, getting another specialist was all very straightforward. And now that involves sometimes having to move to the new hospital. But we've worked processes around that, and I think it's working really well now. OK, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in, in your submission, you, you, you refer to uh, banking uh, surplus with the Scottish Government, £7 million, pounds, and then that being released this year and last year in order to meet these. Uh, uh, how does this mechanism work and is it is it a capital mechanism only or does it apply to revenue funding as well? We've been doing for a number of years, Convena is essentially um, brokering money with uh, Scottish Government in anticipation of needing it for the move. So we had been building up our previous year's cost reduction plans to, to create that buffer knowing that when we move into the hospital, our cost base increases um, as, as we planned and budgeted. And I, I would like to probably put on record our appreciation to the Scottish Government in, in managing that, that cash flow with us. It's been very helpful. It would be very difficult to undertake a, um, uh, a capital development of this scale without that flexibility between years. So that's worked well for us. It's essentially into your flexibility. So you have capital allocations for year A, which you don't fully draw down on the understanding that you'll be able to draw them down in year, year C. That's right. And, and we've been using revenue in the same way. Um, we've, been, we've been banking revenue with the Scottish Government that, that we've now drawn down to allow us to deal with the higher cost base associated with the new hospital. So that's been a good example, I think, of, of Scottish Government working flexibly with the board. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to address some of the staffing issues, uh, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank the panel for their contributions uh, so far. Um, many of your contributions have involved recruitment and staffing, so I want to drill down into some of these issues. Um, having a quick glance earlier at the ISD Scotland uh, consultant vacancy rates, if I've understood them correctly, um, that your board has the highest consultancy vacancy rates in mainland Scotland, and if you look at figures for over six months, you are the highest in Scotland, including the, the island boards. Clearly, there is understanding, I think, of members for some of these reasons. Um, but could you talk a bit more about your initiatives that you've got to try and address that extremely high uh, vacancy rates? I can start. 
Vina, and then again, I'd like to bring in Ken Donaldson, who's who's leading on this this work. Yes, I I think the the recruitment difficulties that we are now facing um, are are of a scale that, that is our biggest single challenge. I think mon money keeps me awake at night, but recruitment is the one that is that is having the most direct impact on our staffing teams and their ability to deliver the sort of quality care that they want. So I think this is the most urgent issue for the board to fix and I think uh, and I take personal responsibility for this I think we were late seeing the scale of the difficulties um, we had we were as a board I've, I arrived in Dumfries and Galloway in a, in a previous role in 1999 we were a board that had no difficulties in recruiting we had long lists of applicants for consultants jobs our GPs did not experience difficulties and I think we were slow to realize that this was not a temporary blip in recruitment, but that this was a structural change that was going on, and clearly you can see it across, particularly rural um, Wales, England, as, and, and obviously Scotland. So I think we were we were slow to go off the blocks on that, and I take responsibility for that. But I do think we've now got a raft of um, initiatives going forward, and I'll bring uh, Dr. Donaldson in to, to discuss those, if that's okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're just we're in a different place. And have been for a few years now. It used to be it's not simply about advertising, whether it's on show or in the BMJ or other journals. There's a there's a, there's a different uh, uh, requirement for us to, to find um, permanent staff. Um, I think what I've certainly found over the last few years, um, and I'll explain some of the reasons why I found this out, but really out there, well, there's, there's clearly less people out there to be applying for jobs, but Dumfries and Galloway sits a little under the radar. You know, a lot of people suddenly don't actually know where we are, or what, more importantly, what we have to offer professionally in the way of, you know, we've got this lovely new hospital and what we can offer there, but also in the way of quality of life and, and what, how the, the surrounding area and how, how, how lovely it is a place to, to live. Um, however, saying that, the, so the, some of the initiatives we've um, engaged in uh, to try and, and get staff, one is we've um, employed it with a, a headhunting agency who um, our initial tender was just for five posts, which I'm pleased to say they have um, filled for us. So that's two consultants, two specialist doctors and a, and a GP. And working with them, I uh, and a few others um, went to Sweden on a recruitment drive, um, which was an interesting and, and a bit of a learning process. But then there were, there were many doctors in Sweden who were looking to come to the UK. So we had an opportunity to go out with that company and, and promote them, Friesen Galloway is the, the place to, to come. Um, we have been involved in international recruitment um, as well, mainly through a more uh, national approach, but that's been really successful for us, particularly in radiology, which has been an area that we've been really struggling with for some time, but we now have a number of filled posts and that's been a, a real change for us. Um, I have, well, I, just over a year ago, myself and a team went down to London to the BMG Careers Fair, which is, I think, where I, I first realised that a lot of doctors, particularly in England, didn't really know where it, Dumfries and Galley was or wanted to offer. Um, so that, that was a useful exercise. And we went down again just a, uh, just over two weeks ago. Um, it was more it was an NHS Scotland um, and stand we're at this year. Um, and as part of that, we've been throwing out our prospectus. So we've developed this prospectus. I'm happy to, if you want to pass that around, but that's just something that we can we can hand out to any uh, careers fair or any um, thing like that that we're at. Um, we have been fairly active in using social media, um, and particularly in Facebook, but other forms, Twitter, etc. Um, and I certainly see an awful lot on, on, on Facebook. Now, coming from an NHS Dumfries account, um, advertising roles in a, a quite sort of pictorially attractive way. But other ways, we have one of our local GPs um, has an account called DG Connect, where it's based on recruitment, but it's more about promoting Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and if you look at this perspective, you can see there's, there's lots of pictures in the front of members of staff holding a card saying who they are. Thank you. Um, and so he puts out a picture that sadly has used myself, maybe not the most pictorially best one to use, but this it says medical director, but it says a little bit about me, why I'm in Dumfries and Galloway, what I like about it and, and what opportunities, etc. So we've been trying sort of innovative things like that to get our, our brand out there, as it were. Um, the final bit, I guess, to that is in the recognition, I guess, what Jeff was saying that we as a, as a board need to really sit up and take notice is that we've agreed as a management team to recruit a team locally who will be 
about recruitment, but more about sort of digital media marketing and how we how we brand Dumfries and Galloway and how we get out there um, and have a much more different approach. So kind of what I'm describing, but maybe a more consolidated, coordinated fashion, and not just around medics, around nursing, AHPs, etc. as well, which we, we have problems in recruitment. Um, in the longer term, there's things like Scott Gem, which you're part of, and then that's, that will hopefully, um, you know, bring us certainly GPs, but people who wish to come um, to the region. Um, and even more in the longer term, we're doing we're promoting uh, healthcare professions in schools. So going out to schools and talking, you know, so do you want to be a nurse? Do you want to be a doctor? And, and explaining a little bit about what that can tell, what we have to offer. And I think ultimately I'm keen that we, we bring you know, fairly young school students into the hospital, say, or into GP practice and show them what, what there is there. It's not just about being a doctor or nurse. There's working in laboratories, there's working in other areas of healthcare as well. Thanks. That you're, um, I think you touched on and you'd be aware of the scheme with St Andrews University in Dundee and UHI from my patch in Highlands and Islands. And that's the very point they were making, that the way you, you retain staff is by having a lot of local staff and the best way of doing that um, is by having some connection at school level as, as well. And it's, ob it's obviously uh, obvious that uh, universities that train medical students, like in Glasgow and Edinburgh and so on, are liable to retain them. And if you look at the league table, you find that that is in fact the case. But if I go to one of your neighbours, I know you can't speak for NHS Borders, they, they have a very, very low uh, vacancy rate. Um, is, is there any compare and contrast that you could usefully inform the committee about as far as that's concerned? It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a bit, I'm maybe being a bit unfair, but I guess you're right, Borders does share a lot of similarities to Prince Galley, but I guess it's one slight difference is it is generally just a little bit closer to Edinburgh and Lothian, and they do share an awful lot of services, whereas we sit a little bit more indistinct on our own. We have links with Glasgow, obviously, but there's something about geography there, I think, that just means we're not really commutable from Glasgow, unless you live out sort of Lockerbie End, etc. But even that is, is still a bit of a journey, uh, whereas I think a lot in the borders is a much easier commute to Edinburgh. As I say, I'm guessing. I don't know as that's for a fact. But I think it's important to realise that, that we're asking families to move quite often in, into Dumfries and Galloway, and, and that comes with it. The, the, the professional, quite often professional role for the spouse of the individual that we're recruiting. And in a, in a small economy such as Dumfries and Galloway, that's particularly challenging. We link up with the council to look at uh, joint opportunities. So if they're recruiting a, a, a teacher with a, a partner who's a nurse, for example, we can make those links. But if somebody is, uh, has a profession outside the public sector, the, the private sector in Dumfries and Galloway is relatively small, and its ability to, to absorb uh, those, those sort of newcomers is, is commensurately limited. I think that may be a slight difference between us and Borders with its, with its sort of Edinburgh hinterland. But as, as Ken says, we're surmising. We, we um, speak frequently with colleagues at NHS Borders about what they are doing with recruitment and retention. We are confident that they are not, they have not hit on secrets that we haven't, um, but we're certainly keen to learn from whoever is uh, currently being successful in this field. And so the effect of having a high consultancy rate that I mentioned earlier, is that you're going to have high agency costs. And obviously I've noticed from the figures that they've, the figures have shot quite a lot up in the last 12 months, which I know must give you some more sleepless nights, uh, Mr. Ace. <coughs> I can totally understand that. Um, and most of, the, most of the locum costs that you have, uh, uh, most agency costs, are into medical yes. locum. Traditionally, we've we've used very little nurse agency, which is which is slightly different from the pattern across Scotland. You'll see some some hot spots. It's really only been the last twelve months and last winter in particular um, that we started to see gaps that we couldn't fill in nursing staff. And I, I think Ken's point: we we must make sure that when we um, reinvigorate our approach to recruitment and become much much broader based in terms of our use of social media, that we don't just focus on medics, that we get ahead of the next set of problems around nurses and AHPs. But at the moment, you're absolutely right. Our cost driver is around is around medics. You, you mentioned my my sleepless nights, which I've brought up myself. Uh, we we can manage this cost more or less that that's not what worries me it's the impact on our on our teams that are working with non-permanent staff members 
who are much less engaged in service redesign, are much less willing to take on or able to take on clinical leadership roles, and the pressure that that puts on the residual teams, that's the bit that, that we, I, I think, are impacted on by locum staff more than, more than the actual financial hit, great as it is. Many, many uh, boards that have appeared before us before have said the solution to any problems they have, and most of them are financial recruitment, uh, involve two main things, which is, um, first of all, what you can do with regionalisation, and secondly, what you can do in partnership with national government. Uh, you've obviously done a lot of very interesting uh, initiatives about recruitment fairs and, uh, which, and the uh, prospectus about the region, which seems very sensible. Is there any other initiatives then you think that national government should be doing which will help your particular issues? Okay, if I can take regionalisation first, with the, the, the West of Scotland regional um, work is, is quite interesting from our perspective and we have had some um, successes where we're uh, looking very closely at aligning our vascular network that is currently um, a partnership between ourselves and Carlisle. We're looking very closely at realigning that with West of Scotland, which will give us uh, certain advantages. In terms of sustainability, we've got a very good uh, partnership with Escher and Aaron around urology services, uh, particularly in the west of the region. So some of those regional initiatives are working for us. Uh, again, I would probably need to caveat in realism just the, the distance and travel time between, say, Glasgow and Dumfries and Galloway makes joint appointments inherently inefficient. We will lose a, a, a fraction of capacity simply by the M74 travel time, but there, there are things that I think we can, we can make progress on in specific areas. Nationally, I, I think um, we, we would welcome um, continued focus on the attractiveness of living in rural Scotland. Uh, and not with rural Scotland not simply meaning the Highlands and Islands. Um, I think that would be very welcome. My final question, uh, uh, we've already touched on Brexit and I'm loath to raise that issue at my last question, um, but you mentioned that you're having a discussion obviously about Brexit and that will be on your risk register. In terms of staffing, uh, how significant are uh, employees of the other 27 nations within De Vries and Galloway? And looking beyond that for the Tier 2 visas, how significant are employees from out with EU as far as your employment status are concerned? We are about, in, in conjunction with other mainland boards, we are about to formally survey staff uh, to, um, achieve num to achieve the precise numbers, and we'll work with those individuals on an individual basis. We're lucky we're a relatively small system. We know that uh, EU staff are absolutely critical to our continued um, uh, safe working. They are, uh, they have been um, a hugely important part of the success of Dumfries and Galloway, both in uh, primary care, in dentistry, and in our acute service. They're an integral part of our service, and it is. Um, it is deeply uncomfortable to go out to survey those individuals and to, to talk to them about their needs. Um, just a quick sub convener, thank you. Um, Jeff, you mentioned the distance and time travelled, and I know that's an issue for people just even going it within the health board from Stranraer to Dumfries. But digital infrastructure and the roads infrastructure is obviously an issue. A75, 76, 77, we're always bleating on about how we need to invest. So how does the digital infrastructure and the roads infrastructure affect attitudes towards recruitment? Is that a challenge where we really need the government to pay attention and contribute significantly, uh, maybe more, about digital and roads infrastructure? That would be welcome. You, you will see if you get a chance to look at our brochure. We've tried to create a map uh, demonstrating travel times to um, Glasgow, Edinburgh, but also to Newcastle, Manchester, to show that Dumfries and Galloway is, is not remote in in um, uh, in the, the sense that people from England might might think it is. But clearly, anything that can be done to to minimise travel times to airports, to min to minimise delays in in accessing fast broadband, it, it, it increases our our offer. Uh, to individuals and particularly with individuals with with young families things like digital connectivity are as important to them as as the, the train commute to Edinburgh uh, so it, it is part of that 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 offer that we are trying to create 
to for people to come and and live with their families in Dumfries and Galloway, and for that offer to be attractive, we we need all of those advantages lined up. So so help would be greatly appreciated. And that would include uh, railway as well, as well as the roads. As as a team who have uh, suffered from a train cancellation this morning and a very stressful drive up, that would be most appreciated. Okay. Okay. Okay, Thank you very much, Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Camino. I'd like to turn the discussion to child and adolescent mental health. Um, you have uh, your performance in Dumfries and Galloway is higher than the national average, for which you're to be commended. However, it is still uh, worryingly difficult, I think it's fair to say, and represents a declining picture. I, I just wonder if you could uh, explain to the committee what the primary barriers are to having children seen within the 18 weeks prescribed. Okay, I'll, I'll see this one. Um, I, you're absolutely right. In terms of our performance in Dumfries and Galloway, um, I'm disappointed to say that our performance has deteriorated. Um, however, we are starting to see some shoots of improvement with our latest performance between April and June sitting at 77.6% in relation to the target. The challenges that we've had in Dumfries and Galloway have been sort of twofold. They've been around, again, comes back to this recruitment issue difficulty in recruiting to posts and the same applies within our child and adolescent mental health service as well as um, we have had some difficulty in sort of backfilling posts um, of individuals who are ha having um, taken on roles elsewhere national roles and that might be challenged around why are we not keeping people locally but we're really keen to learn from experience elsewhere so it's getting the balance between how many of our staff members we keep locally and how many we encourage to learn from experience elsewhere we also are seeing increases in terms of the demand for our child and adolescent mental health service, um, but we do triage our referrals um, three times weekly um, in order to make sure that those um, children and young people who have got the most urgent need are seen as quickly as possible. Um, we have also introduced an, a number of sort of improvement projects within our child and adolescent mental health service. Um, we have introduced a primary mental health worker in general practice. Um, so this is a, a mental health professional who works within general practice and who receives direct referrals from the GPs of children and young people with mental health problems. And we've seen that that has significantly reduced the demand on our tier three specialist mental health service. So that pilot has been running for a year. And in the practice, which was one of our large practices where um, we received the direct referrals, we saw that very, very small numbers of those children and young people had to have onward referral to the specialist mental health service and indeed all of those children and young people were seen within three weeks so that really sets us a, a target for us within Dumfries and Galloway and we have with our new mental health strategy funding um, identified the development of these primary mental health workers in general practice as a key priority for us and we will be extending the number of those across Dumfries and Galloway to improve access to children and young people to mental health services um, and to reduce our waiting times but also to provide that early assessment of children and young people where we saw as I say those children were seen within three weeks. Um, we also have introduced a mental health worker for um, urgent referrals um, within Dumfries and Galloway. So that's somebody who undertakes urgent assessments of children and young people who present to us with mental health problems. So for example, those who are maybe admitted to hospital following an overdose, for example, and that mental health worker, our evidence to date shows that we are able to provide those assessments for those children and young people with either the same day or the following working day. So those are some improvement projects that we need to roll out. Um, and we are confident that we'll see some improvement in our performance towards that 90% target but as I say it is coupled with the challenge of the difficulty that we have in recruiting um, we've talked about our medical recruitment our nursing recruitment is equally challenging particularly in the specialist areas like child and adolescent mental health services Thank you for that very comprehensive response and you clearly seem to have a handle on what's going on. Can I ask about specifically tier four referrals because one of the problems we've noticed in wider parts of the country is uh, those young people who are um, referred for inpatient support at tier four level but then are turned away effectively because there is insufficient staffing capacity to support them. What is the picture in Dumfries and Gallery for tier four? 
we do have challenges in terms of access to tier four services as is common across Scotland but what we do is we, we will make sure that the level of support that we can provide then to those children and young people through the tier three service is delivered in as timely a manner as possible to avoid any further escalation of needs um, for those children and young people. I don't have data in front of me in terms of the numbers of people that we have had waiting for tier four but I can provide that to the committee and um, following the discussion today but it's very small numbers for Dumfries and Galloway in terms of numbers who are waiting um, for tier four. Thank you. Can I move on to the other area? Okay, I'd like to um, move the discussion on unless any of the colle my colleagues want to come in on CAMS. Okay, um, just looking at uh, the, your complaints processes and um, one of the things that jumped out of the, uh, this, the ISD figures for me was the fact that in terms of your response rate, um, it's sitting around 55% um, being seen within or responded to within 20 working days, which is quite significantly below the rest of the field. And I just wondered if you could explain why that is. Thanks. Yes, this this has been uh, an issue of contention at our board for uh, some some months and possibly even longer than a, a, a year. We've been in the process of revamping our complaints process um, to deliver something that we think will provide a greater degree of satisfaction for complainants and I'm very pleased with the way that that work is developing but what it has done is created a, um, a, a process that is not moving quick enough to, to hit the target. We've made it clear and, and uh, the chairman has made it clear to us as executive directors that we can't simply sacrifice timeliness for this enhanced quality and our preference for meeting physically with complainants so that we have to achieve, we have to square the circle of timeliness and quality and we are pushing on that very hard at the moment. You will see those figures improve quite dramatically over the coming months as we, as we, as we make that system uh, slicker. But, uh, but to go back to my first point, I am pleased that we turned the system upside down to, make, to look at actually what complainants were receiving from us and how satisfied they were with the complaints process and what we could do to make that better. I think that was a good piece of work. I think where we've slipped up is we've not really mm. then taken a, a lean approach as to how we can do that in a timely enough fashion. But we are under great pressure from uh, our chairman and the other non-execs to turn that around and we will. Thank you for that. I, I think one of the reasons behind my question is that um, when it's clear that, that um, rates of response to complaints or complaint systems in general are suboptimal. It gives cause for concern about other areas where complaints are important. And I think this committee concerns itself quite often with the issue of whistleblowing. And we obviously um, exist in a landscape where that's very uh, contemporary at the moment, particularly around uh, the travails of other health boards. Can you explain to us, uh, well, whether, first of all, whether you think, um, given in the context of the slow response rate you have for normal public complaints, whether internal complaints um, are dealt with appropriately and that your systems are robust? Yes, I, I can give that assurance to the committee. Um, we, have, we have a, a relatively flat management structure in Dumfries and Galloway and I guess that's a, um, a, a symptom of being a relatively small system and it does allow us to quickly address concerns that are raised to understand the pressures that staff are under at various levels in the organisation and to respond accordingly. We've had two whistleblowing uh, incidents in, in Dumfries and Galloway in, in my time as chief exec, both dealt with, um, with the, our established process. I would hope to see no more. Um, I think whistleblowing is a, is a symptom of where your, in, your internal controls and checks and assurances are not working appropriately and a symptom of staff frustration with that. I would be deeply disappointed if staff felt that they could not raise uh, concerns appropriately to myself, to Julie, to, to, to Ken or to their general management level. That's not the organisation I've tried to create in my time as chief exec. We, we pride ourselves on being a, uh, an open and transparent organisation and I think the, um, the evidence of our walkarounds, our individual discussions with managers and their teams 
and the performance that we that we have delivered in the light of great pressures over the last few years is, is a testament to how our staff are working and how they're working with us. Thank you. A simple question: Do you follow, in relation to complaint handling, do you follow the SPSO guidelines? Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Pittle. Thank you, and, and good morning. I want one of the, the sort of key strategy objectives and aims uh, is this progressing between uh, or, or shifting resources from acute to uh, sort of community care. Uh, and I wondered uh, whether you could uh, let us know what progress you're making in that area. Yeah, uh, so in terms of shifting the balance of care and, and moving um, resources from one part of the system to the other, I think it's important to highlight to committee, I'm sure you're all aware of our integration scheme within Dumfries and Galloway being quite unique in the sense that it includes all of acute services, all of community health and social care services, primary care services, mental health services. And the reason, one of the primary drivers for that was to ensure that we had transparency in terms of the use of resources across the entire health and social care system. Um, so as the Chief Officer of the uh, IGB and the Health and Social Care Partnership, I'm absolutely clear that I have got that authority and control for the integrated budget across acute services, community health and social care services and mental health services, as well as a range of other services within um, Dumfries and Galloway. As a result of acute services being delegated to our IGB, I would um, suggest to the committee that our IGB is extremely aware of the significant demand pressures that are facing acute services across the whole of Scotland. We are aware of that increasing population of older people and the material demand that people living longer with multiple long-term conditions has on our acute service. Um, in terms of, we, we talked about the, the new hospital earlier, when we were modelling the new hospital, the bed modelling for the new hospital, we made some assumptions about the use of acute services within Dumfries and Galloway for us to live within that bed model. And those assumptions included us reducing the demand for acute hospital beds and reducing our length of stay within um, acute hospital settings. We have... Um, we have projections of an increase in population of older people up until 2035, and we expect that that will continue to provide pressures in our acute service. So as an IGB, we haven't been focused on taking money out of acute services, but rather on spending larger proportions of our total delegated budget on community-based services compared to acute services. So that's been our focus about what's that, what does that balance look like? Our forecast for this year in terms of the balance of that split is that at the end of 2018-19 we will spend approximately 49.8% of our budget on hospital services and 50.2% of our budget on community-based services. And for me that is a significant achievement in Dumfries and Galloway given what you've heard earlier about the development of a brand new district general hospital and all the additional costs that come with that. So, as I say, we have, we've also seen considerable increase in expenditure in acute services because of the new hospital, the new nurses that, that Jeff alluded to, um, increase in domestic staff, etc. But it's important to say that with, we look at the totality of that resource that's delegated to us because on paper there are some developments that may look like they're an investment in acute services in Dumfries and Galloway. So we've agreed to the recruitment of an additional palliative care consultant, an additional care of the elderly consultant and a new integrated, a new integrated respiratory team. Now all of those may look on paper like it's an investment in acute services because that's where... Those, those budgets sit at the moment in terms of palliative care, care of the elderly, etc. But they're actually investments where if we are able to recruit to the posts, and again, we have difficulties in recruiting to both of those consultant posts that I've mentioned. Um, but if we do recruit to those posts, those are absolutely about providing services within the community. So I would just, I would highlight to the committee the, that split in terms of our expenditure at the moment and our focus being very much on increasing that proportion of our spend in community services compared to um, acute services. You, you sort of mentioned earlier on that uh, um, uh, in, in pre the, the prevention agenda is going to be is, is sort of key to your uh, sort of long term efficiency yes. uh, um, um, project or project projecting long term efficiency. I wonder if you, you, you maybe have some examples of, of, of where 
uh, where that, that sort of resource is starting to shift towards that sort of prevention agenda. Okay, so specifically in relation to the balance of care work, um, we have in the last year um, spent over a million pounds on a rapid response service in our biggest locality in Dumfries and Galloway, um, in Nithsdale. And that, that service was introduced to um, work primarily with GPs around the avoidance of unnecessary admissions to hospital and um, to support discharge from hospital. And we are, um, the feedback from our general practice has been, our general practices has been very positive in relation to that in terms of the impact that that rapid response team has had on um, providing GPs with an alternative to sending someone to an acute hospital, and that, that has been very positive. Um, we are also um, working very much with our, at the, at the very kind of upstream end, um, we're working on um, our focus as a partnership very much on reablement. So we have a reablement service, um, which is called our STAR service, which is focused on um, encourage and um, providing inputs and support to individuals to bring them to a level of independence that's the maximum level that can be achieved for that individual given their long-term condition or their disability and last year we had over a thousand people in Dumfries and Galloway referred to a reablement service um, and over 55% of those individuals were actually discharged from a reablement service with no care and support and that reablement service gives them rehabilitation um, activities of daily living support, but to also importantly signpost individuals to other community-based activities and support. So that might be things like walking groups and craft activities um, to encourage people to maintain their level of independence at home. But we're really proud of the, the outcomes from that reablement service because we're able to demonstrate that, as I say, almost 60% of people who go through that service have, either, have been discharged with either no care or a reduction in their care packages. If I could, uh, you, you didn't retain the set aside. and uh, does, that, does that help you to shift resource? In this, into this, this we, of, uh, we don't have a set aside budget because all of our acute services are in the partnership. So the totality of our acute services are within the partnership. So I think it's really helped us in terms of that transparency, in terms of us understanding where our expenditure is and what the out what we are what we are achieving in terms of that expenditure. So um I think one of the, the challenges um is about how do we how do we look at our performance in relation to that expenditure and and having all of acute services in our partnership gives us the opportunity to have really open discussions around our IGB about our spending acute services and how we want to see that shifting. Um, but as I say, it's not about taking money out of acute services. It's about increasing the proportion of our spend in community services. If I could, just 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 in terms of uh, you're talking there about, about the the IGBs, I think does that sort of move towards regional planning uh, that, that uh, is very prevalent at the moment? And I think what we've we've kind of struggled a little bit with, uh, I imagine, is, is how the roles and responsibilities of the board work within that sort of regional planning and and who's accountable and the decision where does decision making lie for service planning, delivery, and performance? I wonder if you maybe able to expand a little bit for us? Well, I'm very clear in Dumfries and Galloway that the, the responsibility for service planning around acute services sits with our IGB. The functions for acute services are delegated to our IGB, so the responsibility for that planning at that strategic level sit with the IGB. However, our IGB has also been actively involved in the discussions around regional planning because we recognise that the sustainability of a number of our acute services for the future requires us to be actively involved in, in regional planning. But in terms of accountability and planning, um, we, we are very clear locally that we have delegated those functions to our IJB and our IJB has that responsibility. But we are active players and active, actively involved in the discussion around acute services because we're very, as I say, the, the sustainability of a number of our acute services requires us to work in partnership across the west of Scotland. So just, 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 yeah. just to be clear there, so you're suggesting the IJB are the, the, the accountable body? 
terms of delivery of those services? No, in terms of planning of those services. So the IJB is a strategic commissioning body. So the IJB has got the responsibility for the strategic planning of those services. I'm clear as the chief officer to that IJB that I'm accountable to the IJB for the delivery of that strategic plan. But in terms of the operational delivery of the services that are delegated as the chief officer, I'm accountable to two chief executives, to Jeff as the chief executive of the NHS and to the local authority chief executive for the delivery of those services. So I've got a dual accountability. Yeah. Bob Doris. Thank you. A fascinating conversation. I was, I was really um, struck by some of the performance outcomes for Dumfries and Galloway. I mean, there's a list here in relation to clinical care and governance of a number of outcomes that don't appear as if they're going to be met. I'll, I'll mention just two of them. Uh, the rate of acute emergency admissions per 100,000 adult population looks in the last quarterly report as if that's unlikely to be met. And the rate of acute emergency admission bed stays per 100,000 adult population. So I'm looking at that, but I'm also looking at, um, for example, in August there, a &E waiting times performance of 93.6. Okay, it's not 95%. But a strong performance. I think there's been a relatively strong performance generally in that area. Also, in terms of outpatients waiting less than 12 weeks, uh, uh, is it 96% above a national average of 75%? And inpatient and day cases under the treatment time guarantee, okay, certainly not there yet, but 84.5% as opposed to 74.6%. So, a mixed bag, I suppose, but. When I previously sat in the health committee, um, targets can, can mislead as well as inform. So there's a tension there between those two things that look as if they're not going to be achieved, and that is acute emergency admissions and some of the good work that Julie White has been mentioning. Because I'd like to get beneath the surface of some of that performance. And I'm wondering, in relation to the preventative agenda, which was the, my substantive question, I just wanted to put some of that on the record about the mixed performance of, of, of the Industry Joint Board and Health Board, is if someone goes in for a catax surgery, that could be an acute intervention. A hip replacement, that, that's an acute intervention. But if you do that hip replacement early, rather than having a long wait, it's actually a community intervention because the, the, they're going to be enabled far quicker and be healthier and safer in their house. Similar with the cataracts operation, where you, when you trace slips, trips, falls from someone waiting oh, far too long for hip replacement or far too long for their cataracts operation, you increase the risk and you drive up emergency admission. So there's an example of an acute intervention that has a direct community benefit. Have you mapped anything in relation to early intervention on acute procedures in NHS that actually has a direct benefit to community enablement and keeping people, particularly an ageing population, in the community longer? Because I don't think the Scottish Government's particularly done that. I think I'm probably going to have to say no to the, to the <laughs> comprehensive question that you asked, because it, it's, a, it's a great question. And we've had discussions uh, individually with clinicians, and I can think of talking to ophthalmologists about our intervention point with cataracts, which is which is lower than some other boards in Scotland, and the discussion being that in a rural community, driving is critical to getting around because of the the, the public transport difficulties that we've that we've touched on. So we we positively recognise that we need to intervene earlier than other systems might be comfortable with, but that comprehensive map of early interventions we don't have. I, I think that this shifting the balance point that was that was raised earlier is a fascinating one and a fundamental one for, for this committee. And I was interested in, in your report that was published yesterday. I, I from, a, from a Dumfries and Galloway point of view, in the, in the lead up to the new hospital, we did an awful lot of health intelligence planning about who would use acute services, given our demographics, as Julie said, up into the 2035s. We could not, with any certainty or any, no matter how optimistic we were, forecast that we would cut acute spending in, in that period. We, are, we, are, we think we have taken an ambitious line of um, being able to redesign lengths of stay and admission rates, as you say, so that we can hold within that acute footprint. But we aren't, we aren't planning for a significant and substantial shift of resources out of acute 
and into community because our, our health intelligence models say that our population will continue to demand hips, knees, etc. will continue to, to require trauma services. And when we model the relationship between age, particularly over 85s, and hospital bed use, we, we cannot see a smaller DGRI than the one we've got now. So I think there's quite, when, when people talk about shifting the balance of care, I think we really need to tease out how exactly are they going to take a system that works on around about three beds per thousand population, which is at the very low end of the European average, how exactly are they going to take out that, that large amount of resource to, to feed into community services? I think it's, it's quite a profoundly important point for future planning of, of health services in Scotland. No preamble to, 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 to the supplementary, I, I, pro, I promise you, convener. Um, Julie White could make a case to say, actually, I want more hip surgeries in the operations and cataracts operations at a much earlier stage than clinicians might be, be able to grant them, and that's for community purposes. So perhaps some of that acute expenditure could actually be transferred over and presented as a bid from community to actually drive community outcomes. Would you seek to map that perhaps in your next annual report? We could map that. And I think this, it's the beauty of our system that, as you say, essentially duly controls the, the expenditure on all aspects of health and care. Now, that's, we, we've, we've been dealt the hand that we are, we are coterminous with the council. So we've been able to take this, this, this unique step of putting all of acute services in. I think it does give us an, a, a unique advantage as well in that we are able to look holistically in that way and we're not seeing a, a sort of sterile competition between community and, and acute services for resource that those of us who are old enough remember from acute trusts and community and primary care trusts, and it's an utter waste of everybody's time to be fighting over, over resources when we should be collaborating with the patient at its centre. I think we, we do have a unique, um, we, we have a unique service model because of our advantages, and I do think we can begin to demonstrate some, some real gains from that com compared to some of the, the more complex models that are necessary elsewhere because of overlapping borders, etc. So, yes. for example, early acute intervention, uh, which, which supports community enablement, because that could be presented as part of the community budget. Is that something you, you may be doing in the future? Certainly. We, we took a paper to our board in June, that, uh, written by our um, public health team, looking at what were the biggest impact interventions that, that could be made. Um, the, from a public health perspective that would avoid um, a decline of individuals into frailty. And key amongst those and top amongst those will work on falls prevention, for example, and on physical activity for all ages in the population. I think that fits very much with your question about that point that you, that you intervene and how successful you intervene to avoid further frailty. That'd be helpful. Thank, you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've, you've referenced our report yesterday in advance of of the budget, uh, because clearly you'll you'll have gathered the committee is very supportive of the the, tra the shift in the balance of care, but very aware of some of the challenges in making that happen. Julie White talked about being accountable to the IJB um, for the creation of the strategic plan and being accountable to both the NHS board and the local authority for the delivery of that plan. How how comfortably does that sit when you're <coughs> presumably employed? Uh, wholly by the NHS uh, and not at all by the local authority and, and, and how does that work in practical terms? In practical terms, um, I have, rather than having a one-to-one -one with Jeff for my performance um, re reviews, then I have a one-to-two with two chief executives. Um, so I have two chief executives who I meet with on a regular basis, who meet with me to discuss areas of operational concern, um, my performance in relation to objectives, etc. So at a, at a practical level, it works well. As Jeff said, um, we have been dealt quite a fair hand in Dumfries and Galloway in the sense that we are a fairly small partnership um, and we are co-terminus in terms of the, the boundaries with the local authority. And I think that we have 
taken the opportunity of that to develop an integration scheme that's as robust as it can be with the inclusion of all of our acute services. So um, at a personal level, I feel very comfortable about my accountability to both chief executives for the operational delivery of services. I also am very clear, however, that I have got an accountability to the IGB itself for that um, strategic plan and the delivery of that strategic plan. And how that would normally work in practice is around our um, I, I have obviously regular meetings with the IGB chair and we've got really strong leadership from our IGB chair and vice chair in Dumfries and Galloway to push forward with our integration agenda. I have regular meetings with both of them and I will present performance reports um, on a quarterly basis to the IGB to give the IGB assur about assurances about the delivery of that strategic plan. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe Dumfries and Galloway is one of the councils in rural Scotland which has talked about uh, joining forces with the local health board uh, in order to form a single entity. Uh, is there, uh, is there a, a, a response to that proposition from NHS Dumfries and Galloway? wasn't aware of that. Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, uh, <laughs> perhaps, I, perhaps I'm anticipating uh, what's Se coming next. Several years ago, we, di we did discuss a scheme um, where um, perhaps councillors could, could act as non-executives. On the, on the health board to avoid, uh, to create a greater linkage. My, my personal view is that I think we are using the IJB vehicle as effectively as it can be used in Dumfries and Galloway. I think the the gains to the to patients' families that we are seeing are, we, we can demonstrate that things are improving and that we are generating improvement. So I would be loath to look at uh, a further structural change that will delay us getting on with what's really important. Thank you very much. Miles, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to ask around um, drug and alcohol services in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, looking at your 2016-17 budget, um, you were asked to find a shortfall of £452,000 after the Scottish Government aid a 20 percent cut to alcohol partnerships. Um, your account suggests you found £234,000 of that sh shortfall. So I wondered what impact this had on service provision in the area. If I can kick off, then again I'll, I'll hand on to Julie. We matched the we were able to match the amount that we'd spent previously. Though, as you said, as you notice, our budget was was higher than spent previously. We had a, a degree of unallocated expenditure. We were about to go into another grant round, so we didn't see um, significant reductions in services that we were able to provide. But clearly, drug and alcohol services are, a, are a, an area of particular focus for us. Um, we have seen an increase in, in drug deaths, for example, in Dumfries and Galloway, and this is an area that I know the, the um, Alcohol and Drugs uh, Committee is working very closely on. But if I can, if I can bring Julie in on the detail. Um, I, I think just to echo what Jeff said, in terms of us being able to match, we were able to match the funding for what we were we were previously commissioning. So it, we didn't have to um, uh, reduce the level of commissioning or, or stop services as a result of um, the the um, as not um, receiving the full allocation. We were in the process of. Um, developing a new commissioning strategy within the Alcohol and Drugs Partnership. And within Dumfries and Galloway, we've actually taken quite an innovative approach to our commissioning strategy um, this time, where we've taken a what we call a co-production approach with service users, their families and carers, looking at what matters to service users in drug and alcohol services, their families and their carers, and them identifying with us what our priorities need to be for commissioning. So we are in the process just now of um, be going out to tender for um, a number of our drug and alcohol services. But that co-production work has really helped us actually be prepared for the additional £505,000 that we've received um, as in Scottish Government funding recently, um, because that has given us some indicators of what matters to people in Dumfries and Galloway and what services we should look to commission. So particular importance are areas of family support. So rather than us just providing support to the, the person affected by drug or alcohol misuse, as providing that support to families and carers and young people affected by substance misuse. So we've been working very closely with partners in the, the third sector, looking at how we can commission um, a family support service. So um, our Alcohol and Drugs Partnership 
brought a report to our last IJB, um, which outlined our um, annual performance and outlined our priorities for the £505,000 investment. And, and I would say as a partnership, we are passing all of the resources that were given to us around alcohol and drugs to the Alcohol and Drugs Partnership for them to work with our partner agencies, with our service users, their families and their carers to identify priorities for use. Jeff did mention the, the issue about drug deaths. Um, as an alcohol and drug partnership, we have noticed that in 2017, we did see the highest number of drug deaths um, in Dumfries and Galloway that we've, we've seen in recent years. Um, we do have a drugs death group that meets regularly. We review every drug death to see what learning can be um, gleaned from that. Um, and the, there haven't been any common sort of themes um, that we've noticed from the increase in drug deaths, with the exception of we've seen an increase in the drug deaths among the older population of um, drug users. So that's something for our £505,000 that we're going to, we need to focus in on in terms of what initiatives do we need to undertake. I don't have the plan for that just now because we're still working that through with the Alcohol and Drugs Partnership. Um, we're also aware of our need to improve our delivery around alcohol brief interventions and that is a key priority for the um, drug and alcohol partnership we um know that we need to increase our number of alcohol brief interventions within the acute setting and within the primary care setting and we're working with colleagues in both of those settings to look at how we can improve our alcohol brief interventions what we think is that a number of these alcohol brief interventions are taking place, but we're not recording them appropriately onto the system. So that's just a kind of summary of where we're at with alcohol and drugs at the moment. Thank you. It's um, useful to hear of these future plans which you've outlined. One, one thing which um, jumped out to me was Dumfries and Galloway has the highest percentage of drug-related hospital admissions, um, which obviously is a sort of crisis point. So I don't know if that's also somewhere for uh, the new work which you've outlined to start uh, cross-referencing as well. Um, we we are um, one of the things that one of the things that we're looking at is around prescribing. Um, so obviously, part of that um, is looking at the reason for the drug related alcohol admissions, and and, and we're looking at what um, support we can provide around prescribing. Um, so that that is something that we can consider in terms of what act, what further action do we need to take to reduce that rate of hospital admissions um, around, that are um, influenced by drug and alcohol misuse. Thank you. I'll be supplementary Emma Harper. Just a quick sup. Thank you. It's uh, you mentioned co-production and earlier talked about preventative agenda and signposting. Um, I recently attended a transforming Wigginshire event, um, and people were using the language co-production. So I'm curious to know what does that actually mean? Because the people in the Rins and the Machers and uh, Wigginshire want to make sure that they are being they're working together and not being tailed. What is going to happen to them. So I'm curious about this co-production issue. I appreciate and, and I, I apologise for, for the use of language that I, I think some people do find quite unhelpful. And I think I actually would echo the concerns of the people of Wigtonshire in terms of the use of that language myself. I, I, it's, it's, it's a new... It's, it, co-production is effectively about us working with people to design the future shape of our services and it is absolutely about us saying how do we work with our local communities to have an honest conversation with them about what the risks are what the challenges are what are um, what the possibilities are around the future shape of services and to really genuinely engage with people so it's not about us within statutory services or indeed with our partners in the third sector coming up with new ways of working and then going and consulting with people on those new ways of working the co-production is about they are involved in the communities the people that we serve are involved in the development and the design of the future shape of services and that is something that we're working really hard to do in Wigtonshire getting out there engaging with our communities not just the traditional ways of engaging with elected members and community councils but actually getting out there and talking to people in our communities about what matters to them what and, and, and talking to them about the challenges that we are facing as a health and social care system so that they can work with us around the design because we recognise that there are going to have to be difficult decisions that are taken in the future. We've talked about the financial challenges that we face. We've talked about um, the recurring financial deficits that we're facing. So there are going to have to be some difficult conversations take place and we feel that the best way of us having a chance of success in terms of um, being able to deliver new ways of working is to have the community 
community involved right at the outset in terms of the design. So that's what we mean by co-production. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks. And a brief supplementary from Sandra Hoyt. I was interested in regarding the drug deaths and older people. Obviously, they've got other issues as well. It's the same in Glasgow and in the West as well. But the other point I wanted to make was about the alcohol. Uh, I was uh, on a board of an inquiry, and most of uh, people who had problems with alcohol and alcohol deaths were 55 and over. Uh, I wonder if you had found that, and a lot of it was to do with loneliness and isolation, that they weren't going out. They were buying, drinking, sitting in the house. I wonder if you... I've seen that as well, no? I don't actually have I don't have figures, so I wouldn't be able to I mean what we do know what we, we do know is that we have um a number of older people who are experiencing loneliness and isolation and quite often as a result of that people can turn to alcohol, misuse alcohol. So we are doing um a piece of work within our communities around addressing loneliness and isolation in older people. Um in order to promote um, their engagement with other community activities. But I don't have the details in terms of a number of um, service users that, that are admissions in relation to alcohol, but I could certainly provide that to the committee afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much. And finally, Keith Brown. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the hospital. Um, it forms no part of the briefing that we have today, nor of the internal, uh, sorry, Audit Scotland report, but it's a remarkable achievement, so well done for that. We're not good as a parliament at recognising things which have gone really well and learning lessons from them, so well done. Two of the issues which were mentioned were in relation to Brexit. First, recruitment's about to be impacted by Brexit, I'd appreciate. But you mentioned before the cost of medicines. And I think you said that potential, because of the coming out of the EMC, possibly a three to four times increase in terms of medicines. But you also mentioned in relation to New Zealand, where they could sometimes get cheaper prices, that they didn't have the kind of infrastructure of drugs companies and pharmaceutical companies. Now, we do in Scotland, and I just wonder whether there's more scope to work with the pharmaceutical companies who do have a massive impact in the economy by coming to some agreements with them, of course, in the right way, which recognises their contribution, but also allows them to be more certain about the business that's coming their way. We've got a fairly unique uh, situation, probably in the southwest and the northeast of Scotland, and surely we should try and use that to our advantage, especially to mitigate what seems to be quite a chilling uh, prospect of a three to four times uh, increase in costs. Yes, I was, re I was referring to particular products there, not across not across the board. I, I think if, if we are in a deal scenario for Brexit and we have a transition period, I think those type of negotiations can be very productive. Um, the concern for the health service at the moment is, is primarily focused on the no deal scenario and, and essentially a, a, a hard Brexit on uh, 30th of March next year. And then it will be quite difficult, I think, to replicate our current supply line uh, arrangements and the price that we will be able to buy products at will, will reflect our desperation for those products. So that there is a, there is a real concern about, about that no deal scenario and our ability to, to provide business as usual services in that, in that context. Just, I, it, it's not so much to do with, uh, I understand what you're saying about the two different scenarios, the Brexit and no deal or um, some other kind of deal. And I'm not sure this has to wait to find out how bad Brexit's going to be. The idea of perhaps a new deal with the drugs companies whereby their contribution to the economy is recognised in some way that allows you also to strike a deal with them. And it wouldn't just be ourselves, I appreciate that would be across Scotland, per perhaps even across the UK. But if there's not some scope there to try and address what seems to be a big a big problem for you guys just now? I think there could well be scope, and that, that's a very optimistic a, a, and positive way to look at, at future relationship. I, I guess we have to look at the reality that we are moving from being um, potentially very, very large purchaser of drugs to being commensurately smaller purchase of products and our bargaining position commensurately um, uh, deteriorates. But but this is th these are manageable problems, I think, and what, what you're talking about in potential opportunities is exactly the right way to look at it. The the unmanageable, from my perspective, and, and the, the, the issue that, that is making, I think, health services across Scotland very uncomfortable at the moment is that 30th of March position, if there isn't the ability to, to work as you suggest. Thank you very much, and can I say thank you to our witnesses uh, for your evidence this morning. That's been very helpful. You've offered to uh, provide some more information following the meeting. I, I noted uh, CAMS Tier 4, uh, Alcohol and Drugs Action Plan, and uh, Work on Loneliness. 
and also something further on the recurrent and non-recurrent savings as that becomes clearer. We may also have one or two further questions we will put to you in writing uh, after we've had the opportunity to discuss them. Uh, but can I thank you very much for your attendance this morning uh, and uh, uh, we will now uh, suspend briefly for a couple of minutes and then when we return we'll move into private session.